The day is January 22nd, 1879. A small band of British soldiers are stationed at a makeshift hospital known as Rourke's Drift. Meanwhile, an entire army has moved into what is then known as Zululand, home to the fiercest warriors in all of Africa. Many thought this war between the English and the Zulus would be quick. After all, the Zulus only used shields and spears that they called assegais. How could they possibly stand up to the mighty and technologically modern British army? Little did the British know just how desperate things were about to become. Uh, there is a 10,000 foot view and a 10 foot view when it comes to history. And the closer we examine that history, the more personal we make it, the better we can understand what happened. Today we are not examining the, the full story of the Anglo-Zulu War, nor diving too deep into the politics that caused it. Instead, we are looking at a specific event and basically going through it step by step in an attempt to understand and hopefully get a glimpse of the utter ferocity and intensity of the battle. This is the Battle of Rourke's Drift. Having received an ultimatum from the English, one which the Zulus could never accept, a state of war commences between the two nations. King Cachueo is no idiot. He was a rather skilled negotiator, especially when dealing with land disputes with the British and Boers. Though he expelled most missionaries and began expanding the Zulu army, things were going well until the discovery of diamonds within the area. It turns out Cachueo was right at expanding his army because the British, they wanted what was his. To sum it up, Henry Bertel Frere, the British High Commissioner of Cape Colony, South Africa, gives Cachueo an ultimatum, stating that he was to disband his armies. Now, this is unacceptable. Not only would this leave Zululand absolutely vulnerable to the British, which is what they wanted, but it would mean the destruction of Zulu culture. Zulus were militaristic. Their army was literally their culture. To take that all away in one foul swoop, that's just impossible. It'd be the destruction of them as a nation and as a people. This is a hyper-masculine culture reminiscent of the Spartans in ancient Greece. And the British knew that Quechua would never accept these terms. They wanted war, and war was what they were going to get. Quechua knew that a war with the vastly technologically superior British would be a problem, so he had hopes for a negotiation of peace, especially from abroad. His overall tactic was defensive. Only when the British crossed into Zululand would he attack. This way, he can make the case of being a defender against British aggression. The British government at the time is said to have not wanted the war, but Frere did. He had a chip on his shoulder against the Zulus. So basically, they had to use what was available, knowing there would be no reinforcements coming from England itself. Under the command of Lord Chelmsford, he had a Napoleonic battle tactic in mind. When invading Zululand, his goal was to march divided, but fight united, essentially. Words straight from Napoleon. According to Dr. Eirik Nasbacher from the Royal Military Academy in Sandhurst, each column would be logistically independent of the other. Move into Zululand, keep two detachments in reserve, then swing and hit Ulindi, the Zulu capital, thus fighting united. The problem is that Chelmsford didn't have a large force at hand. If this tactic did anything, it weakened the already weak army. And if the Zulus were good at anything, it was exploiting vulnerable forces out in the open. And the main Zulu battle tactic was built and designed for such an occasion. To put it politely, the Zulus are the most feared warriors in all of Africa. These are soldiers trained from almost birth to be warriors. 
The Zulus used a rigid regimental system, but not like one we'd see within Western armies. The Zulu regiments would spread across Zululand, and they would have their own logistics and small little communities. When Quechua required them to fight, he sent word out, and the regiments would suddenly unite and fight whatever battle the king saw fit. What made the Zulu so successful was their tactical discipline. These are men who could run miles upon miles upon miles on bare feet on harsh and hot African terrain and still fight a battle. And they were brave. Extremely brave. To the Zulu warrior, these regiments were more than just a cluster of fellow soldiers. Regiments were extremely competitive, both for glory and the right to marry. To the Zulus, their men would not be allowed to marry and have children until their 30s, when they had proven themselves as beneficial to the Zulu kingdom. If a group did not perform in battle, if they performed poorly, like a reserve regiment, for example, they would not be allowed to have children. Because to the Zulus, only the strongest can provide for the future of their people. This would prove to be important later on in our story. The Zulus had long used a military movement, which is almost more than just a field tactic. It's practically cultural for the Zulus. This tactic is called the Horns of the Buffalo. Essentially, the Horns of the Buffalo were made up of three distinct parts. You had the horns, which were the right and left encircling attack thrust, made by usually younger, greener troops. Then you had the head, which was the coup de gras of the entire tactic, the prime fighters, which would run straight forward and overwhelm the enemy. And then you had the loins. These are the reserved, and these are also often the, the older veterans of the group. The British were not only marching divided, but they were working with faulty information. Chelmsford had little to work with regarding to what the Zulu army was, where, and when. Yet Cachuayo had small groups of scouts positioned all over the place. They would hide in the brush, they would look out over the hills, they'd report directly to Cachuayo. Cachuayo also placed spies within Tal contingencies within the British army. In other words, he knew exactly where the British were, what they were doing, and where they were going. Before war was declared on the Zulus, on January 9th, 1879, Chelmsford and his third column marched towards the Buffalo River, which formed the border into Zululand. He made camp just outside a small compound made of two buildings and a cattle corral. This compound was Rourke's Drift. Rourke's Drift had two thatch buildings and a corral used for holding cattle particularly. Currently the compound is owned by Swedish missionary Otto Witt. Witt leases Rourke's Drift to the British to use as a hospital and storage space. Witt spoke fluent Zulu after all and he acted as an interpreter for the British stationed at Rourke's Drift. While he sent his family away, the British ordered Rourke's Drift to be turned into a military checkpoint of sorts. This is where reinforcements will arrive, the bridges will be built crossing into Zululand, and the wounded and sick will be sent back as the war continues. It is decided to leave behind 300 men of the Natal native contingency to help guard and perform some of the dirty work around Rourke's Drift, while the bulk of the army crossed into Zululand. These forces were dressed just like Zulus, with shields and spears. Their only distinction was a single red band that they would usually wear around their heads. It's easy to see how the Zulus had infiltrated them, but unlike their Zulu counterparts, these native contingencies were much less eager to fight. Perhaps this is why these 300 men were left behind at Rourke's Drift, mainly to do uh, the dirty work, such as make the sandbags and build the bridges and swords. Another group to be left at Rourke's Drift was B Company of the 24th Regiment of Foot, under the command of Lieutenant Gonville Brumhead. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Chard would be left behind with numbers of the Number 5 Field Company of Royal Engineers to help build and maintain the pontoon bridges leading into Zululand. 
There's also Surgeon James Reynolds. He arrived at around this time. Witt's home was soon converted into an outright field hospital, mainly to deal with the sick more than the wounded. After all, this is Africa. You're wearing wool uniforms in what is easily 100 degree weather. Bugs carry unknown numbers of diseases. And this is an army on the march. Disease is bound to be rife. And like always, it was. These group of men were under the overall command of Major Henry Spaulding, who served as the chief supply officer. The invasion of Zululand had begun. Nothing of note occurred between January 11th and January 22nd, 1879, other than a few skirmishes here and there. Many British officers were growing bored of dealing with the slow logistics and slower-than-expected movements into Zululand. And also, the Zulus had yet to put up a real fight. In fact, they hadn't seen much of any Zulu movement at all. But that all changed in the mornings and afternoon of January 22nd, 1879. Lieutenant Chard arrived at the pontoon bridges on January 19th and began making repairs. However, he soon received a dispatch that he doesn't quite understand. It appears his sappers, his builders, were needed at Isandawana, where the bulk of the 24th Regiment of Foot was encamped. He gathers his troop from 5th Company Royal Engineers and rides to Isandawana as ordered. But he learns he's not needed upon arriving, only his sappers are. And he complies, leaving his men at the main column near Isandawana. Confused, he looks at his orders, which explicitly state his focus is to be on the Buffalo River's right side, so the British side of the river. So after arriving, he is immediately sent back with only his wagon full of supplies and his driver to construct new defensive positions for the oncoming British reinforcements. Meanwhile, as he leaves his men behind, he spots movement off in the distance. He grabs the nearest NCO and looks through his binoculars to see thousands of Zulus on the move. These hills were full of the brown and white shields as the enemy army marched as one unit. It can be inferred that this might have been why charged sappers were needed in Isandawana. The British could see the Zulus, but were unaware of their intention. Perhaps the sappers could help construct a basic defensive position. Admittedly, the information here is a bit sketchy. Chard fears that the Zulus might be moving to get between Islandawana and Rourke's Drift, cutting off the main column. He mounted the wagon and rode off to Rourke's Drift as quickly as he could. After arriving back at Rourke's Drift, Chard immediately goes to see Major Spaulding, Lieutenant Brumhead right on his tail. Chard reports what he has seen to Spaulding, and that a likely Zulu attack is to commence somewhere around Asandawana. Having observed the Zulus, Chard mentions that the enemy could be moving to attack the bridges, cutting off their main column from escape. Even more importantly, how could he defend the bridges with only seven men? That's all he had stationed there. Reinforcements were supposed to have arrived already at Rourke's Drift from Captain Rainforth's company, yet they were nowhere to be seen. Why? This question intrigued Major Spaulding. A low rumble can now be heard in the distance, everyone stopping what they are doing and now looking out over the Buffalo River. There's no mistaking it. That low rumble was cannon fire. Specifically, they are the low rumbles of the two seven-pounder field batteries stationed at the Sandawana. Thinking for a moment, Major Spaulding asks, Which one of you is senior? You? He points to Chuck. Or Bromhead? Chard doesn't have the foggiest idea, neither does Bromhead, so Spaulding leaves the two lieutenants alone and gets his army list. After a while, Spaulding returns. I see you are the senior, he says to Chard. So you will be in charge, although of course nothing will happen, and I shall be back again this evening. Major Spaulding decides to leave in search of the whereabouts of Captain Rainforth's reinforcements. So he places Chard in temporary command of Rourke's Drift as he rides off to find more information. Little did they know at the time, but Spaulding putting Chard in overall command of Rourke's Drift may have been the greatest decision made for this battle. 
Chard is one of those rare cases where he is the wrong man at the right time. After all, he was an engineer. He didn't think so much like a tactician, but as a builder. In reality, Brumhead seemed more inclined to be the proper officer in charge. After all, he was a decent soldier raised in a notable British family. Chard was a nobody, just a man sent to Africa to build a bridge. After Spalding leaves, Chard leaves Rourke's Drift to return to his camp by the Buffalo River. If he's nervous, he's not showing it. But something has changed within the last hour or so. Specifically, the sounds from earlier. They had changed. Many had noticed this change because the cannon fire from Asandawana had begun to stop. The British must have beaten Zulus off. Or perhaps this was just another small skirmish that happened to have artillery involved in it. Regardless... Chard sits down and eats his lunch, when off in the distance, riding like a bat out of hell, come a few disheveled men, covered in dust and grime, their horses soaked in sweat. He can barely hear what they're shouting. To camp spin overtaken by Tezulus! To camp spin overtaken by Tezulus! Chard runs to meet them as they cross the river, and he's met by Lieutenant Gert Ardendorf, a Boer of Natal native contingent. What are you to officer? Ardendorf asks. Chard answers that he's temporarily in command, but Ardendorf quickly dismounts his horse and takes him aside. There, he explains that the guns falling silent did not mean victory, but catastrophe. At Isandawana, where Chard had been just a few hours earlier, the Zulus attacked in force. 1,300 British, colonial, and native troops were attacked, overrun, and slaughtered by over 20 thousand Zulu Impi, where they quickly and efficiently use their horns of the buffalo to devastating effect. Chard cannot believe his ears. After all, here's Ardendorf, excited, panting, full of emotion. Surely he was exaggerating. But Ardendorf's companion, a carboneer, confirms the story. Chard swings into action, grabbing his horse, when suddenly a message from Lieutenant Brumhead arrives asking him to return to the camp immediately. Chard orders the breakdown of the camp and to put the supplies into the wagons as quickly as possible because reality sinks in. If the Zulus had overrun Asandawana, they could be heading directly for Rourke's Drift. Nothing would stop them. Chard also has six men posted on the opposite side of the Buffalo River on the hills to act as lookouts as a warning if the Zulus arrived. Arriving back at Rourke's Drift, Chard calls a meeting with Brumhead and Commissionary Officer James Langley Dalton to help reach a consensus. Do they gather their sick and wounded and retreat to help make our where there would be reinforcements, or do they stay put and make a defensive strategy? It is Dalton who suggests that they stay and fight. But this isn't a decision made out of honor or bravery but out of sheer desperation. If the British gathered their sick and wounded and marched off to help Maekar, they are perfect targets. They would be slow-moving, mostly encumbered soldiers, which the Zulus would want. If they construct barricades, which Brumhead was already in the process of doing, they would at least have a fighting chance. This is where having Chard in command seemed to pay off the most. Together with Brumhead and Dalton, they deduce that Rourke's Drift actually makes a surprisingly good defensive position. The two houses are not overly far apart from each other, and there are stone walls already connecting them. If they flip the transport wagons, those can fill the gaps between the walls and the corral. If they stack melee bags on top of the stone wall, they can make a good defensive position to repulse oncoming Zulu assaults. The problem is there's little time to do this, and a lot of work that needed to be doing. But the stone walls also benefited from being built on a small four-foot rocky ledge, which put the defenders at about seven feet above where the Zulus would be attacking, making Rourke's Drift a small makeshift fortress. The store and the missionary, converted by now into a hospital, was also being loopholed. This way, soldiers can stick their guns out and fight. This hospital had about 11 rooms. Five of them had no internal door, which means they needed to use the external door to get in and out of the building. There is also a shortage of windows, which would prove to be beneficial during the battle. 
it will be hard for the Zulus to actually get into the hospital for this reason. But the lack of doors would prove to be an issue. Nevertheless, if the Zulus came, there'd be no possible way for escape. Their only hope for salvation would be for British reinforcements to arrive and relieve them. Private Alfred Henry Hook, someone who will become important later, said of the situation, We were trapped like rats in a barrel. There is no denying the desperate situation befalling the British here. Interestingly, Lieutenant Ardendorf decides to stay and help with the defenses, while the others who escaped the Zandawana passed by, exclaiming the hopelessness of their situation. This made Chad somewhat irritable, as it caused great moral problems for the soldiers, but they nevertheless continued to work diligently, as if their lives depended on it, because it did. At around 4.20 p.m., gunfire came from over the hills, making the nervousness already running through Rourke's drifts even worse. But the worst was yet to come. After a brief scrapple, around 100 Natal native horse soldiers galloped down from the hills. These were survivors of Asandawana, who had just fought a battle and had ridden hard throughout the afternoon. They gallop up to Rourke's Drift, where an officer professed to charge that the Zulus were indeed coming, and their situation was hopeless. To save themselves, they were now riding to help make care. Though Chard and others pleaded for them to remain, they rode off, leaving the British to their own devices. Seeing this, those 300 native contingencies mentioned earlier, whose numbers had dwindled since the invasion of Zululand started, they began to desert. They completely ran from their posts and made a break for it. This dwindled the numbers of Rourke's Drift from around 340 men to just 140. This also includes the 30 men who are sick and wounded in the hospital. Several of the British soldiers grew furious at the native contingencies when they noticed their officer, a corporal named Anderson, running with them. Several soldiers, including Private Frederick Hitch, opened a fire on them, killing Anderson. Most escaped unharmed. Anderson would be the first casualty of the upcoming battle. But Color Sergeant Bourne looked at their desertion, the, these natives' desertion, as a good thing, feeling that the native contingencies, they were untrustworthy, and in battle, they needed men they could trust. So while now they had less men, they were all people they could rely on. Chard reassesses the situation briefly as the men continued to work. He shows his engineering skills here and deduces that they are now too thinly spread out. Springing into action, he plans what is called a redoubt. This would be a wall of biscuit boxes and melee bags made with the sole purpose of a fallback point if the outer walls are breached in any way. The time is now 4.30 p.m. The walls are still in construction when from one of the rooftops, Private Hitch cries out, Zulus, to the south. They're on the other side of the rise and extending for an attack. How many? Asked Brumhead. Hitch replies, four to 6,000 of them. The men in the hospital had not had time to make holes in the walls between the rooms. Everything happened so quickly. This will make communications inside the hospital extremely difficult. Each room now needs to act as its own contingency instead of one solid unit. But Private Hitch had spotted around 500 to 600 Zulu warriors who had snuck their way around the southern flank. The Zulus had arrived. At around 4.30 p.m., the Zulus appeared on the southern flank of Rourke's Drift. The British had yet to complete their fortifications, and already the Zulu Impi were upon them. These Zulus had not fought at the Battle of Hasandawana. They were the loins, the reserved forces often called the Undi Corps. They are ordered to swing west and south to sever the line of retreat and communications for the British army. These warriors were armed predominantly with short spears and hide shields, as described earlier, but some carried outdated muskets. However, their marksman training had been poor. While the Zulus at Azandawana were led brilliantly by Nkosi Katmampitha, the command of this Undi Corps, marching on Rourke's Rift, fell to King Ketchwale's half-brother, Prince Daublamanzi Matankembe. 
Unlike Adesan Dewanda, the prince acted in direct violation of Quechua's orders. He crossed out of Zululand and into Natal, Africa, British territory. These warriors were older, and they wanted the right to marry, as described earlier. They wanted glory, as they saw it robbed from them at the Sandawana. They wanted to carry the honor and prestige of having the Zulu white shields with them. Altogether, the prince has around three to 4,000 Zulus under his direct command, and they were now marching upon Rourke's Drift, and they wanted blood. Having just run miles upon miles upon miles, these men were tired, but no less determined to make a name for themselves. These Zulu warriors beat their shields, chanted their cries of death and intimidation, were fed their narcotics, and were blessed by their witch doctors for total victory over the British. And now they charged straight for the southern walls of Rourke's Drift, and the battle had begun. Private Hitch yells to Brumhead, They'll be all around us soon! Brumhead snaps into action. To your posts, men! He shouts, the British grabbing their Martini Henry rifles and pith helmets as they clamor for the walls. Hitch suddenly hears a gunshot and ducks the bullet way off. He can see a Zulu upon the hills in front of him, the musket smoke thick. He fires back, but misses, continues to scan the area. He then notices a Zulu moving into the caves on the hill, a lone warrior appearing, the Zulu waving his arm back and forth. Though Hitch did not know it, this Zulu was likely Prince Katmpende, the prince signaling for the assault to begin. At around 500 yards, Brumhead gave the order to fire. At first, the British Martini Henrys did little, but as the Zulus grew closer and closer, the true extent of their firepower became more evident. One after the other, the Zulus dropped, most of them wounded with gaping holes made by the powerful 577-550 Martini Henry round. Entire limbs would be blown off, blood flying in every direction, coating their fellow warriors around them. But they were Zulu! Zulus don't run that easily. Despite their losses mounting, the British fire non-stop, their chants, Usu! Usu! The chant of their king, kill, 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 death, 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 echoed loudly in the surrounding hills, encouraging others to keep going, keep fighting, keep running. Chard recalls seeing the oncoming Zulus and thinking that nothing could stop them. No amount of volley fire halted the oncoming advance. Private Hook can see the Zulus coming within 50 yards. They became stuck in a deadly crossfire, one from the hospital, the other from the storehouse. But soon, everyone can see that the Zulus had begun using the cookhouse and the stoves left in the camp as cover. Zulus with muskets were brought forward from these positions and they began to fire upon the British with little accuracy. The Zulus used anthills, brush, empty boxes left by the British, fallen comrades, anything that could help shield them during their advance on Rourke's Drift. Eventually, even the Zulus could see they needed to regroup and pull back after suffering horrific losses, most of them wounded. The British had held the first wave, the Zulus not making much of a dent once they reached the walls. Chard, Brumhead, and Dalton's plan appeared to be working. They had taken few casualties and sustained a heavy attack. But their relief would be diminished as a regiment of older Zulus charged and wrapped around the smaller fortifications to the west side of Rourke's Drift. The Zulus continued to move until curving around and attacking the north wall. Now they had an attack from the south and the north at once, stretching the British dangerously thin as Chard had feared. But what kept the Zulus at bay was a constant stream of fire, thanks to the chaplain, who organized wounded soldiers to help disperse rounds and cartridges to soldiers fighting at the wall. It was not uncommon to see wounded soldiers crawling on the dusty ground, empty shells all around them, handing bullets and planting cartridges at the feet of the main defenders. The next Zulu wave began, this time with a new strategy. Using the brush as cover, they crawled their way until getting relatively close to the British walls. Then they sprang up, starting a protracted assault along the northwest ramparts. The hospital was now under assault, Dalton inside trying his best to ascertain the situation. He can see the desperation of the defenders holding back at bayonet point the oncoming Zulu attackers. He notices a corporal in trouble, a Zulu standing over him, ready to stab the boy with his assegai. But Dalton grabs the nearest rifle, prayed it was loaded, and fired, killing the Zulu. By now, the Zulus had ascertained that the British walls were just too high to cross. Many hid below them as the British fired overhead, surrounded by their screaming and wounded. 
but in the nearby hills, the Zulus began raining down fire of their own. Using their outdated muskets, they aimed at the defenders below as best as they could, most of the shots missing but nevertheless causing a great annoyance for the British. Meanwhile, another wave of Zulus crashed against the hospital and northwestern walls like a tsunami crashing against the shoreline. Here, in their desperation, the Zulus managed to climb over the wall by using the bodies of their fallen warriors, most of which were still alive. Using the bodies as stepping stools, they scaled the wall, and a fierce melee ensued with Brumhead in the thick of it. Using his revolver, Brumhead stood firm with his soldiers fighting the Zulus off, sometimes two to three men at a time. A cadence began to shape. The British soldiers forming small groups of twos and threes, while one man reloads, another man fires and covers him with his bayonet. When the other man is reloaded, he fires and covers his comrade with his own bayonet. It became a dance of life and death, the Zulus showing no signs of stopping. Eventually, the melee proved to be too strong for the British, and an order was given to regroup and pull back. The British do so, gathering in ranks and giving massive blasts of controlled volley fire into the oncoming Zulu ranks. This proved too much for the already weakened Zulus, and at the point of bayonet, Brum had led in advance and retook this portion of the wall. Color Sergeant Frank Bourne could see the Zulus leaping over their parapets, many grabbing hold of British bayonets only to be blasted by a Martini Henry. The carnage was immeasurable, their entire chunks of flesh, muscle, and bone exposed from these wounds. Yet Bourne could not help but admire the bravery of these Zulus, finding respect for them, a respect he never had before. Having watched every movement made by the British from on top of a nearby hill, Prince Katmpende deduced that the weak point of Rourke's Drift was the front of the hospital. Now, despite the heavy losses, the prince could enact his coup de grace. He could advance the head of his buffalo, his horns revealing the enemy's weakness. A new assault began, this time the Zulus concentrating all of their power on the front of the hospital. Yet here exposed the fatal flaw of Zulu tactics. Keshweo gave no tactical device other than this single point. The Zulus were not to attack defensive positions. For their warriors to succeed, the enemy needed to be in the open and exposed as they were at the Sandawana. The prince failed to heed this order, or better yet, he failed to adapt his strategy. Charred witnesses wave after wave after wave of Zulu attacks against the hospital, only for each to be repulsed, the Zulu survivors crouching down and disappearing into the thick brushes. From inside the hospital, Private Hook defends one of these rooms. Aiming through his loophole, he fires shot after shot from his rifle. He remains to be the only defender in this room, a sick man beside him and a man with a broken leg on the other side. He refers to the sick man as old King Cole. King Cole kept up with Hook for some time, but he got scared during the fight. He cries out that he isn't going to stay in this hospital anymore, but Hook knows better. These walls were safer than being out in the open with hundreds of Zulus coming at once. He pleads with King Cole to stay, but the man has made up his mind. Hook is powerless to do anything, fires a few more rounds, and watches King Cole be killed. The sight frightens the man with the broken leg. He begins to scream, Untie my leg! I need to get out! I need to get out! But Hook can't do anything. He sees the Zulus, aims his Martini Henry, fires again, the smoke filling the room. By now the smoke was so thick he can barely see two feet in front of him. Gunshots echoing all around him, the Zulus chanting on the other side of the wall, little light coming in from outside, a man with a broken leg beside him wailing away, the Zulu musket fire whistling through the room. It was chaos. And meanwhile, Dalton was on the outside, encouraging his men to stand fast, rifle in hand. He moves back and forth, hands cartridges to soldiers, then takes a few shots himself. Keep steady, he shouts. Keep steady. He sees a Zulu moving up onto the barricades. Pop that fellow, he barks as he aims his rifle. Suddenly, he feels a sharp pain, and he realizes he's not been stabbed, but shot. A Zulu marksman finding his target. A doctor runs up to his aid, rips a hole in his shirt, and discovers that a bullet had gone straight through his shoulder. But that wasn't going to stop Dalton. 
Dalton gets back up and continues to fight with the others. By 6 o'clock p.m., the Zulus began another attack, this time extending further to the exposed left. Chard watches intently and begins to fear that the Zulus could make it over the wall and use their biscuit boxes for cover inside their fortifications. He looks around, sees three or four men nearby, grabs them, and pushes towards the wall section. Brumhead is nearby, bringing two and three more with him. Together, they help hold off this attack, but Chard couldn't see the writing on the wall. The Zulu sharpshooters were getting more and more accurate. He orders his soldiers to retreat to the second line of fortifications since it's shielded from the Zulu sharpshooters. Only just giving the order, he watches a commissary officer giving water to a wounded soldier. He sees that commissary officer being shot in the head by Zulu on top of the hill. By ordering a withdrawal to the inner entrenchments, Chard has achieved two things. First, he can now use the redoubt as cover from Zulu marksmen, and second, his troops will now be in a smaller, more localized area, meaning heavier and more devastating firepower. However, Chard has inadvertently isolated the men in the hospital in doing so. The main British body withdrawing, those left inside the hospital were now isolated as another Zulu attack commenced. This time, the Zulus focused their energy on the hospital's west side. Inside was a scene of utter desperation. These rooms were dark. They had no windows. But as mentioned earlier, many didn't have doors leading from one room to the next. This would prove challenging for the defenders. Private John and Joseph Williams' room became the primary target of the Zulus. A few others were in the room with them, all aiming through loopholes and firing every bullet they had. Yet the Zulus kept coming. Realizing their desperate situation, John Williams, seeing no alternative, used his bayonet to slice a hole into the wall leading into the next room, also being defended by a couple of British soldiers. Joseph Williams and another soldier kept up their fire, holding back the Zulus as long as they could until both men ran out of ammunition. Their bayonets became their only defense. Zulus now bursting into the hospital, desperately trying to break into the individual rooms. John Williams turns, the hole in the wall now complete, yells for the others to get through, but the Zulus are charging inside. Joseph Williams uses his bayonet and beats several away, but he's ripped from the room and given to the mercy of the Zulus. In their bloodlust, the Zulus grabbed his arms and legs and stretched them outward, and with their spears, disemboweled Private Joseph Williams until his body was almost non-recognizable. John Williams was not the only one with this idea of cutting a hole through the walls to escape. Two rooms down where John Williams had headed, nine defenders barely held their own. One of them was Private Hook. The moment Williams made his way into their room, the next hole was almost completed. Then they moved into the next one, and the next one, more Zulus coming in from all sides. Some had even started coming down from above, the Zulus using their spears to cut holes through the straw roof. Hook has just shot another Zulu, reloaded his rifle, felt his helmet yank to one side, knocking him backwards. He looks to one side, notices a Zulu Asagai had been thrown at him, his helmet saving his life. But Hook has little time to revel. As his fellow soldiers moved into the next room, one at a time, a Zulu bolted towards him and grabbed his rifle. Thinking fast, Hook regained control over his gun, jammed a 577-540 round into the chamber, and blasted the attacker at point-blank range. About to head through the wall, Hook happens to see someone left behind, a man nearby named Conlon, who could not walk because of a broken leg. Before the Zulus could get to Conley, Hook made a mad dash for him, the wounded man in one arm, his rifle in the other. He pulls Conley through the small hole into the next room, accidentally breaking Conley's leg again, but saving the man's life. Less than a second later, Zulus poured into their old room. Many seeing the holes in the walls and trying to crawl through it, they were greeted by gunfire and bayonets. Remember, there were little for windows in this building. The only light that was coming in was from the loopholes used for their Martini Henrys. Smoke from gunfire filled each room, blinding anyone who entered. 
little ventilation making it hard for anyone to even breathe. And the sound. The small rooms creating a perfect chamber to amplify the already ear-piercingly loud rifles. Then came the groaning of the wounded Zulus and British, the sounds of people punching holes through the walls, the Zulus themselves chanting and screaming, the British trying to hear one another through the chaos. Insanity is a good word to describe it. All the while, sometime during the desperate fighting, the hospital roof had caught fire. Smoke began billowing down the hallways and into the rooms, Zulus everywhere as well. Many British hunkered down in the hopes that they would wait until nightfall. A few dashed for the new British lines, only to be stabbed to death. However, after crawling through loophole after loophole, many of the survivors made it to the room lining the inside of the new British inner defenses. The wounded were the first to be taken out of the windows. Most were carried to the rear. And better yet, most of the defenders of the hospital made it out against all odds. And while the Zulus tried to capitalize on their capturing of this hospital, it proved unattainable as the building burned around them. In the distance, Major Spaulding was returning with two companies of the promised reinforcements from earlier. Here, Spaulding had hopes of relieving the garrison at Rourke's Drift. A few of the men inside Rourke's Drift could barely make out their red coats, and many cheered. Relief was here, they were saved. But instead of attacking the Zulus as Char had hoped, Spaulding remained still. Spaulding surveyed the area as night rapidly approached. He could see the hospital burning and hear the chants of the Zulus. Instead of riding to relieve those at Rourke's Drift, he turns around. To Spaulding, the number of Zulus was too great, and that the garrison at Rourke's Drift had all been killed. This would be the second time that day that Spaulding would prove to be woefully incorrect. By now, night had begun to fall. Yet even after hours of constant fighting, the Zulus, with their usual tenacity, showed no signs of stopping. After hours of continuous fighting, the Battle of Rourke's Drift continued throughout the night. By nightfall, the flames of the burning hospital illuminated the oncoming Zulus, giving the exhausted British soldiers a good look at their enemy. Despite successfully holding off wave after wave of Zulu attacks, the British now found themselves in a desperate and precarious situation. Having fired almost non-stop, many soldiers found their Martini Henrys jamming from where, or their barrels just too hot to handle. And to add to it all, they were now surrounded. Many soldiers saw the hospital burning as a blessing in disguise. It gave them light, a, a way to see the Zulus as night went on. Private Hook remained at his post, guarding an exposed corner of their defenses. Brumhead stood beside him, the others dead. On more than one occasion, the Zulus managed to penetrate this one point only for Brumhead, Hitch, and Hook to beat them back, guns red hot, bayonets covered in blood and guts. Eventually, one Zulu slipped past them. Hitch saw him and called out for Brumhead. But before he could shoot the Zulu, a musket fired, hitting Hitch through the shoulder, taking a chunk out of his scapula. He crumpled over in pain, sure that this was the end, but Brumhead was there. Revolver crackling off, both Zulus falling to the ground in a heap. He then attended to Hitch. Seeing as his shoulder was all but gone, Brumhead reloaded his pistol and handed it to Hitch. With this new weapon in hand, Hitch continued to defend this side of the fortress throughout the night. Meanwhile, Chard was keeping busy. From inside their smaller entrenchments, he ordered the construction of a new redoubt, a smaller inner circle with stepping stools made of biscuit boxes. If they had to pull back again, they could concentrate in this redoubt, stand upon the biscuit boxes, and shoot down at the Zulus, giving them a better vantage point. But while this was happening, the Zulus had adjusted their plan yet again. Seeing the fires were exposing their attacks, they shifted to the northern walls, where the burning hospital casted a massive shadow. What had been an accidental savior for the British those first few hours into the night had just become their curse. The Zulus crawled on the darkened ground, often over the bodies of their fallen comrades. 
then would spring up at the last second, often just a few feet in front of the British. But as the night wore on and the British became thirstier and thirstier, their water now gone, so did the ferocity of the Zulu attacks. Every time the British would try to leave their new entrenchments to get water, the Zulus would be there to greet them. This dance back and forth continued for hours. Chard continues to pace back and forth behind the walls. He can hear Zulu shouting, Uzuthu! to his left, and then suddenly an attack would come from his right. The Zulus had gone back to playing their mind games, which they did so well, especially in the realm of intimidation. But sometime after 10 p.m., Prince Katampende must have realized his chance of glory had gone. The time had passed. Because Chard notices that after this time, the attacks began to waver, but never stopping full sail. These faint attacks would never stop, however. The Zulus would appear, then disappear just as quickly, keeping the British on edge the entire night. The Zulus playing mind games. But as the hospital fire slowly dimmed and January 23rd began, the fighting all but stopped. Rourke's drift had become a bloodbath for the Zulus. In every direction, their dead and wounded littered the grounds, both inside and outside of the compound. Chard listened to their moans of agony, his men still at the ready to receive another attack at any moment. Chard and Brumhead feared a renewed attack by the Zulus as the sun crested the skies, and they knew deep down that they simply could not hold like they did the day before. If the Zulus came back, the defenders of Rourke's Drift were done for. But Chard can hardly believe his eyes. As the sun grew higher and higher into the South African skies, the Zulus were gone. They had moved past the southwest hills, out of sight, but certainly not out of mind. Having run 20 miles the day before, the Zulus then fought nonstop for hours on end. They were finally too exhausted to continue. They had not achieved the glory they so desperately wanted to. In fact, the entire campaign into Natal proved to be a disaster, just as King Kashwayo predicted. But panic momentarily struck the British as they looked onto the hills overlooking Rourke's Drift. A large contingency of Zulus stood atop the crest, peering down at them with watchful eyes. But soon they too left with the other Zulus having spotted a British cavalry column off in the distance. Relief for those in Rock's Drift was finally underway, and many of these exhausted men found the energy to rise up and cheer the relief columns arriving in force. Some cried, some prayed, and thanked God. Most were just thankful to be alive. They had survived an overwhelming enemy against all odds and lived. 4,000 Zulus, the greatest warriors in all of Africa, versus 180 soldiers of mostly B Company, 2nd Battalion, 24th Regiment of Foot. And now, after all this fighting and death and carnage, came the aftermath. Chard counts 351 dead Zulus as the day wears on, most of the men now burying the bodies and collecting the Zulu shields and spears. The British had also done some counting of their own, and despite their horrific circumstances, the British lost 17 killed and 15 wounded. They soon discovered that the m vast majority of the fallen Zulus were not dead at all. Most of the Zulus still on the ground were alive, buried, under comrades who had crossed over them in the height of the battle. Some had tried to escape, but, but a round from a Martini Henry devastates the human body. In a bit of fury, the British defenders, unable to control their rage at seeing their own dead comrades eviscerated by the Zulus, moved about the wounded and stabbed them with their bayonets to finish the job. Most of the wounded Zulus were bayoneted in the head, silencing them once and for all. Today, this would be considered a war crime, but in the height of the Victorian era, this was just a common act of war. Terrible, but true. It cannot be understated, the bravery of the British defenders at Rourke's Drift. As mentioned earlier, they had survived against odds of almost unmeasurable amounts. Eleven of these men were awarded the Victoria Cross for their bravery.
And while the British bravery is in full display, one cannot deny the Zulu warriors' utter tenacity and determination, strength, and bravery. No matter how many of their comrades were shot down beside them or in front or behind, they nevertheless continued to attack. And ultimately, they paid an exorbitant heavy price. King Cetchwile reportedly said, An assegai has been thrust into the belly of the nation. They had lost brave, experienced warriors that they will undoubtedly have difficulty replacing. And that concludes the Battle of Rourke's Drift. I end this video with a familiar tune because, well, how can I not? This is Adam Noyce. Thank you for watching.